Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Miguel Zuniga, and I'm going to go over and talk to you about some how to do single sign-on on a hybrid cloud. I know that this is OpenStack, but to be honest, all the enterprises are not going to have only OpenStack. They're going to have OpenStack, Azure, AWS, whichever it is. Um, all everything, all this work started two years ago, pretty much. Was working for Symantec back then, and we we're doing a hybrid cloud between OpenStack running in three data centers and AWS. So back then, um, I started doing the authentication for the OpenStack piece, and then tried to plug it into AWS, which is kind of difficult to go over and do it. And then on top of that one, you have a lot of different tools in open source, like um, Kivana or Grafana, that some of them, they do actually provide authentication, some of them, they don't. And actually coding it inside of it, it requires some major um, development effort. So uh, who am I? Like I said, Miguel Stuniga, I usually do software and infrastructure. Um, I've been working from engineer all the way to, down to director on hands-on. Um, if you want to know anything more about me, you can just jump into um, LinkedIn. So what are we? I'm going to go a little bit fast. I tend to talk a lot, but uh, there's a lot of things that we're going to go over and see. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to see why you need a single sign-on. Then the difference between the um, IDP and SP and what's the role of each of them. Then we're going to go over and do some basic um, different protocols and standards that we have for authentication, which is basically SAML, OAuth2, and Open o OIDC or Open um, ID Connector. Then we're going to see some software uh, SSO architectures, and we're going to move forward into how do we need to enable it for OpenStack, then how we enable it for AWS for the for this exactly the same authentication. And then as extra, um, I have a little bit of how to do the SSO for applications that are, that are pretty much already out there, um, that you don't have to go over and recode them itself, put it this way. Um, how to do it on Kubernetes also as well, which is the new thing that is coming on, and then a small demo um, on a small lab that I put myself up there. So um, why are we going to be using single sign-on? First of all, um, simplifies user management. It's way easier to just go over and tell it, add it to the Active Directory because it's tied up to your IDP or pretty much just put it on the IDP itself. It's more easy than going over and creating the user on all the every single um, systems that you have in your enterprise or in your business, and then actually have something that is going to go over and sync between them. Um, that was one of the problems that I had a long time ago um, when I was working for a video game company that we had LDAP and then we have AD. And doing the sync between the two of them required a freaking cron job that was running daily every five minutes. Instead of doing that, um, with an IDP system, it's way much easier because you just put it in the backend directory if you want it, or you just put it on the um, IDP itself, and that basically takes care of the authentication of everything. Um, like I mentioned, it, it's a single point of authentication and authorization for all systems. This means that um, it can do authentication. One thing is that you go over and, and tell it who you are, and the other thing is to go over and tell you what exactly you can do. Uh, in this case, the single sign-on will provide both of them. Um, depending on the protocol that we're using, if it is SAML, it can provide both. If it is open OIDC, uh, OIDC it will basically just provide authentication, um, but not authorization. It, it depends. Um, then the other thing is that you're going to have a single framework for authentication, meaning that any other new application that comes in, you're going to be able to go and tell your developer, you know what, follow up this standard, and you're going to be tied up to it. You're going to have access to all the users, and you can just put your roles on it. Um, you don't have to do any crazy into it. Um, like I mentioned, it, we, it supports multiple protocols. Um, it depends on what is your use case. Uh, so for instance, if you're going to be using for a web interface, um, a UI or some kind, you can put it on SAML. If you're going to be using it for just authentication because you're managing your authorization in your own application itself, uh, you can use Open OIDC. But if you're going to be using something else, like for instance, um, Kubernetes, oh, no, sorry, um, that you're going to be using just authentication and you're going to be using OIDC, then you can go over and tell it, um, I'm going to be using this, but I'm going to be using an OAuth2 server as a resource server. And the resource server takes care of actually giving you authorization to different pieces. 
Um, the users and the operations teams will really thank you about it. And for security compliance and audits, it's way more simple to go over and say, um, give me all the users that you're actually, that you're gonna have access to these systems than going over and auditing every single system by hand um, manually. So what is the IDP and the, and the SP? The IDP comes from um, ID provider and the SP is a service provider. There are the two SO components, the most common ones. The, ID, the, I, the identity provider um, does the user management, basically keeps track of who's who and what, I mean, if they're actually gonna say that they're, act, that they're claiming into it. And the service provider is the one that has all the resources and, and provides the service to the user verifies that the user is authenticated and verifies that the user is authorized also as well. Some examples of IDPs, uh, well, right now on outside on, on public cloud, one of the ones there is, one of is basically Otka, which is the most popular one, um, but you also have some other ones that are open source like Keycloak, um, Glue, and WSO. Um, all of them provide all the services, um, IDP and SP as well. Um, now, if you're looking only for service providers, you can think of it OpenStack, AWS, Google, Keycloak as well, um, on a specific of, um, configuration, and as well as Otka and WSO. You can put it on a service provider as well. Um, the main thing here is that these two um, kind of like um, components are what is actually required to go around and do a proper authentication, meaning that IDP usually doesn't run where the SP is running, and that way you can separate uh, security concerns of going over and saying, you know what, you can actually hack into the IDP because the service provider is sitting on the same network. Um, that's not how it's designed for. That's the reason why they're separated. So going into the protocols, um, these are the, uh, authentication protocols, if you want to go over and put it this way. Um, you have SAML, either SAML2 or SAML2. Uh, SAML1 or SAML2. Um, it's a really old protocol. It's been out there for a long time. Then came out OAuth2, and then now uh, the latest one is OIDC. Um, it really depends on, like I said, on the use case that you're looking for. Um, if you're doing enterprise SSO, uh, most of them will actually require SAML. Um, because it, SAML provides a lot of information about the user. It doesn't provide only like here's your token or here's basically who claims it is. It can provide you all the set of roles, set of groups, anything that you want, user emails, anything like you, that you want into the XML format. On the odd two is um, similar, but it won't actually go over and do the authentication. It will just go over and tell you this user can be authorized for this stuff but it won't go over and say, you know what, this user claims to be this user and it's correct. And OIDC is the other part, which it only takes care of authentication, but it won't go over and tell you, yes, you have access to this resource. So you can think of it as OAuth2 and OIDC uh, complement of each other and um, pretty much that's how it works. Um, now for the use cases, like I mentioned it, um, SAML is the overall enterprise um, use case. On OAuth2 is more focused into API servers um, because you use tokens to go into it. And OIDC um, is more of web interfaces that already have some kind of like role um, in the back end trying to figure out what exactly you can, you can have access into it. Um, the, pretty much the table just tells you a really quick um, interview on what is happening in there. So on the OAuth architecture, on the SO architecture, um, right now, uh, this is pretty much how you usually go over and deploy this stuff. Um, you go over and put an identity provider on each of the clouds, um, on each of the regions if you want to. Um, they can go over and just replicate themselves. Uh, they have different pieces. Uh, the one that is more accessible and easy to go over and configure and set up right now um, is Keycloak, and all the demo is gonna be based on that one because um, it's really straightforward to go over and do it. Um, and the replication of Kiklo has a HA and active active um, using InfiniSpan, Infini, Infini which allows you to go over and just have um, IDP running in AWS and modify a user in there. And doesn't matter if it is not connected right away with the IDP of OpenStack, it will go over and just um, replicate it later. So the users have these multiple ways of doing things. You can go over and access um, through the unprotected app, through a secure proxy. Um, the secure proxy basically becomes the OAuth2 server, which go over and tell you, okay, now that you're authenticated with the IDP, 
I'm gonna go over and let you pass over or not to the specific resource that you're putting in. You can do um, an SSO capable app if you wanna go over and implement your own SAML um, um, client and connect it directly to the IDP is also as well possible. Or you can go over and access it through the public cloud IAM client, uh, which in this case we're gonna be using AWS, or accessing to OpenStack uh, through Horizon. Um, we're gonna go through each of these settings and how they work on each, um, on each of the use cases, and then afterwards we're gonna see the, like I said, the small demo. Um, outside of this stuff, um, the IDPs are usually monolithic applications. They're not microservices but extending them is really straightforward. Most of them, they just basically use a database to store the, to store the, the things in the user, um, from, or actually the details of the user, and everything else is pretty much done at the application of the IDP, so increasing memory, or, and all of them are stateless uh, because it's HTTP, so scaling it is basically just adding more nodes into it. Um, so SSO with OpenStack. Here's a little quick how to do it uh, really fast. What's happening in here? Um, OpenStack, in order to do SSO, you need to enable federation. Um, once you have federation enabled, you pretty much configure um, Keystone, you configure Horizon, you configure out Melon. Um, the reason why we're doing Melon is because it's really straightforward, uh, just it works as a proxy for authentication between the identity provider and Keystone itself. Um, at the beginning, a uh, few OpenStack um, releases back. It, doesn't it didn't support OIDC or it didn't support anything else. Um, so you have to use OutMelon. Right now, um, you can use it if you want to go over and use directly with SAML. Um, I think in the latest in Pike is going to be supporting OIDC, um, but I need to double check that really quick. But the usual workflow is that the user logs into Horizon um, then Horizon goes over and requests uh, Rarex to Keycloak. Inside of the Keycloak or the IDP, the user authenticates. Um, the IDP connects to your LDAP or to your user database to match user passwords and all that kind of stuff. And then um, pretty much goes over and talks to Melon. Melon and Keystone, they keep the communication between themselves in order to go over to translate from what is um, the IDP SAML pieces into Keystone. Um, you can see it as a translation between SAML and Keystone itself, and Keystone roles. And then once that is actually running, um, instructs Horizon to go over and say, you know what, let the user actually log in. So in order to set it up, uh, you pretty much deploy Apache Melon, which is basically just HTTP with the Apache Melon, um, uh, the Apache Melon module. You modify uh, Keystone.conf, local settings, um, and then you, bunch, you run a bunch of OpenStack commands in order to create a the federated domain, the project domain, um, the federated group, add the role that you're gonna be using inside of um, OpenStack, and then create the identity provider, set up a bunch of mapping rules, and define the protocol that the IDP is gonna be using for those mapping rules. Um, at the end, I'm gonna give a, a GitHub repository where it's basically all the config files, so if you wanna go over and try it out, um, so all these pieces are required to just set up this, this thing. After you're done with it, you're gonna have um, the users being able to authenticate um, into OpenStack, and all of the users are gonna be living inside of the federated domain. Um, if you wanna go over and do another um, specific user, or sorry, another specific project, you can go over and put it in place, but you have to pretty much create also the other pieces that are um, basically assigning the identity provider to that specific federated project or the federated domain. And it's basically just doing OpenStack uh, roles, groups, and, and users over and over and over. So once you have that done, let's say you wanna go over and your company is gonna go over and tell you, well, it's nice to have OpenStack, but we also have AWS running because marketing is doing some website in AWS and we need to tie it up to the same authentication. Here's the tricky part, um, how do you do it? With the IDP, uh, pretty much you can just put it in place and tell it to use AWS IAM client for SAML. In the case of a public cloud, this is only for AWS, but it works with Azure and works with um, Google. Um, you have your IAM, server that you're gonna go over and, and use to create your identity provider in it, and then create roles, exactly the same way as in OpenStack. 
And inside of Keycloak, you just define, or inside of your IDP, you define another client, another SAML client, that is gonna be doing exactly the same pieces, but without the melon that requires, right? So in this case, the user logs directly into Keycloak in order to access um, IAM. The difference here is that um, there's two, in SSO land, there's two options. You can have IDP SSO or you can have SP SSO. The IDP SSO is when the identity provider starts the authentication. The SP SSO is when the service provider starts the authentication. In case of OpenStack, is S um, is service provider or SSO. In case of AWS or Google or something else, it's gonna be um, IDP SSO. So um, that being said, um, the user logs into, into the IDP itself, um, authenticates, and if that actually happens and is, is properly done, it will, the IDP makes a post to the service provider, in this case I am, and tells it, you know what, I have this user with this role um, that is already authenticated. You have access for it. If I am replies back with the, to the SAML post, um, with the SAML XML post saying, yes, I do have access into it, then I'm gonna give them access to the UI, or I'm gonna give them access to the CLI. Doesn't matter which one is it. Um, and how you set it up, uh, like I said, you create another client. In the IDP world, every single application, whether if it is a public cloud, a private cloud, or another app, it's a, just a client that you're actually working with. Um, you create the SAML Kiklo client, um, and then you configure IAM to go over and match the role that you have and the group that you have inside of your IDP with the ones that you have in, in IAM itself. Um, once you pretty much set it up in that way, you go into your public cloud provider and specify, okay, now I'm gonna give you the specific access to these guys, like for instance, this group in this role will have access to create instances, or this group in this role will have access to um, use database as a service, pretty much the same way that you do it already in, in OpenStack. Um, the only difference here, like I mentioned, is how the authentication starts. Um, in this case, since um, it, most of them, all of them, all the public clouds are pretty much kind of like a closed source, um, you have to go over and, and start the authentication from the IDP. Um, once you have it uh, uh, up and running, the IDP will just go over and, modi and check that SAML post that it's actually doing and that it's receiving in order to go over and authenticate. Um, everything else, all the roles, all the other specific pieces are actually managed by the service provider itself. Um, so, those are the two examples of SAML, but what happens if you want to go over and use um, something different, for instance, an OAuth 2 server? Um, then, here comes the other tricky part. Let's say that you're going to go over and you go back to your um, CTO and you tell it, you know what, I have OpenStack now running, now I have the public cloud now running. So what exactly do I need now? And, you, and he comes over and tells you, well, we have these legacy applications running in Windows that is running on a IIS server, um, and we don't have authentication at all for it. So how are you gonna protect them? Well, you can use um, the SSO for applications. In this case, um, it's a little bit more complicated. It requires a secure proxy or a security proxy. The role of the security proxy is to do the authentication um, instead of the actual application. Um, what happens is that when you try to go over and log in into um, the specific URL that you're given of the proxy, the proxy will tell you, you know what, you're trying to access this backend URL or this application in the back. You're gonna need to go over and tell me um, and authenticate whether if I need to let you pass or not. On that case, um, the proxy or the gatekeeper will go over and talk to the IDP, pass over the user and, and password, and pretty much check the roles. Um, the IDP responds back um, to the gatekeeper or to the secure proxy and tells it, you know what, these are the roles um, and the user is good to go. The proxy itself goes over and has a small map that goes and tells you, okay, you can have access to this URL, and you can have access to this other URL, or you can have access to this other URL. Um, that way you can create a really granular um, access into your legacy application without modifying the application itself. Once the prox secure proxy is good to go with your roles and the, uh, and the access that you're requesting into it, um, sends the traffic directly to the backend application. 
All of this stuff converts the, um, the proxy. The whole point is to create an OAuth 2 out resource server, where it goes over and depending on what the, on what the protocol is giving you on the roles and the access, if you're authenticated, the resource server goes over and tells you, okay, I'm gonna give you access to this specific resource. Um, now, what can you go over and do into it? You can pretty much just enable it to go and tell it, okay, all the application has access to um, requires authentication, or to the point where, you know what, this URL has access for the admin group, this URL has access for the super user group, this URL has access for development, and you don't have to modify anything else. Now, how do you do this stuff? Um, you create your OIDC client in, inside of the IDP. Then the things pretty much is just configuring what is gonna happen with that client and give them the exact backend URL. Um, what it's gonna show if the user is not authenticated, um, from where it actually come from, or what exactly paths are coming from that are gonna be authorized, and pretty much just remove the full scope um, if you don't wanna make it like kind of like global authentication. Then the second part is you go over and inside of your IDP you create your user and groups if you don't already have them in LDAP. Um, if you have them in LDAP, you can just let them actually go over. Um, it will go over and grab them from there and pass it over. And then you create the gatekeeper or the secure proxy configuration. Um, specify the same client ID, same secret, the discovery URL, which is basically the um, IDP, and the target URL. The target URL is always your backend application. And, and you then you specify which um, map and the map rules are gonna be, um, whether if this user with this group is gonna have access to like for instance slash um, marketing site or slash development site or slash um, HR. And then you're good to go. Um, the same way that this stuff is working, um, similar works for um, SSO and Kubernetes. Kubernetes, one of the things that it came out, uh, when it came out, didn't have any authentication at all. It was just like, Google, we don't care about it. We're basically just running jobs on it. But then came up OpenShift, and OpenShift decided, you know what, this is not gonna work at all. And they started doing the authentication themselves. Um, they tried to push it back into the Kubernetes community, but the Kubernetes community said, no, you guys are crazy, we're not gonna push it into it. And it had to pass over like probably about a year or a little bit more until the Kubernetes community started doing, saying, you know what, everybody's looking for authentication. So we're gonna try to put it in there. But in this case, um, they basically have the options of doing cluster role binding objects where you store what exactly, which user, no, which user, uh, which group is gonna have access to which options or to which um, actions in the, cluster, in the Kubernetes, but it won't actually store the users for you. Um, so Kubernetes came up and say, you know what, if you wanna go over and do something, uh, you can put it in OIDC and we'll treat it as an OAuth 2 server, which is basically the same thing that we were doing for the secure proxy. But in this case, the secure proxy is Kubernetes itself. Um, so in order to do it, and what happens here in, this, in, in the Kubernetes world and the SSO is that you go over and the user requests the token um, and configures kubectl. Kubectl then goes over and talks to Kubernetes when you go over and say, oh, I'm gonna get all the pods that I'm gonna be running into it. Um, Kubernetes has the, ID, the information of your IDP itself and goes over and authenticates yourself and tells you, oh, is this guy really who's claiming to be? Yes, no, and if, it's, if it is, then I'm gonna go over and look into my RBAC, uh, which is basically cluster role bindings or, or cluster roles. Um, objects inside of Kubernetes, and there it's gonna tell you what exactly he is accessing to it. Um, that is pretty much the same kind of like procedure that he's doing for all the other SSO implementations, but it's pretty much done by Kubernetes. So in order to use it, um, in order to make it simple, Kubernetes went over and said, you know what, just let's do something really simple. We can tie it to Google OAuth 2, we can tie it to GitHub OAuth 2, to any other OAuth 2 um, implementation that we can go over and put in place. In this case, um, those implementations are basically just doing the authentication, it's not doing the authorization, so we can use any IDP for it. Um, the quick how to do it, you can just put it the OIDC client, um, create the group for the cluster admin, create the, uh, the group for the um, cluster users, um, then create the cluster role um, for Kubernetes admin users, and the cluster role 
for the Kubernetes uh, users themselves. You just have to pass the OIDC parameters into your queue of API server and restart, and you're good to go. The next time you try to go and log in into it, Kubernetes will basically go and tell you, if you don't have the, the uh, proper token, I cannot verify who you are, so it's not gonna let you do anything in there. Um, I don't remember what time I'm gonna stop. So, um, that being said, let's go over and do a really quick demo on whatever we're gonna show up here. I tried to finish it up, the Kubernetes cluster, but I didn't have time into it. So we're gonna do a small single sign-on on OpenStack Lab. Um, it's basically just the VM running all the controllers into it. Uh, we're not gonna care about like going over and creating VMs or anything like that. The whole idea is just focus on the authentication. The same thing is gonna happen with AWS itself. And then we're gonna do an app that doesn't have authentication at all, that we're gonna put authentication without even touching it. And all the configuration files, you can go over and download it from that um, GitHub repository if you guys want to go over and do it. Um, it will work with everything. Uh, the only thing is that I don't recommend using it for production instances. You can based on that one to go over and do it for production, but it's not gonna go over and tell you um, configure your IDP for like HA in this way. It's more about configure your IDP, your client in this way to go over and have the authentication. Um, so let me just go over and see how much time do I still have. Uh, three. Okay, I have 20 minutes. So, like I mentioned it before, we're gonna be using Keycloak um, because it's straightforward to go over and do it. Um, so on Keycloak, um, you have the administration com console, right? So we're gonna admin, then secrets. I hope it's gonna work. And here you can see you can have multiple realms. Each realm means that it's like a global configuration. Um, inside of that global configuration, you can, ha you can have multiple clients and multiple um, identity providers if you're gonna federate itself or you can have uh, multiple backends um, for uh, user federation, which is basically means connected to your LDAP or to your AD. Um, on the clients, since we're gonna be using the same authentication for all of them, we have, um, there are a bunch of them that are actually um, predefined, but this is the one for OpenStack. Um, we have the one for Kubernetes, we have the unprotected app, and we have the uh, IAM itself. The fact that we have all the clients here, it means that any user that is tied up to this realm will have access to all of this. Um, and not, not, I'm not mentioning Keycloak. It will have access, the same user will have access to AWS, the same user will have access to OpenStack, the same user will have access to the application um, that is not protected. But it depends on the roles that you're assigning into it. So we over, I already pretty much um, put out some groups into here which is the AWS user, cluster admins for Kubernetes, the OpenStack users. Um, we have a couple of users that we already define as, as well. Uh, we have uh, JDO and MDO. And then we have um, some roles as well here, which has ad admin. Um, why I'm not putting all the other roles um, inside of here? The reason is because, like I mentioned, it depends on the protocol that you're working on. Since the app is working more as an authentication, um, open IDC, kind of like resource server behind the, the actual secure proxy, I need to say specify the roles in the IDP. All of the other roles are gonna be stuck either on OpenStack or in the public cloud provider itself. Um, so in order to go over real quick, um, let's just jump into the controller. It's gonna open Horizon. Let's do OpenStack first. Will take a while. Once you configure Federation, you're gonna be able to see either you have SSO or your custom credentials. Um, you have any other type of IDP here, it will basically show it for you also as well. Um, once you click, if you go over and specify credential, custom credentials, basic standard thing, you go and put SSO. Um, you go and click connect, and that's where, hold on, I need to go and clean and clear the sessions. Give me a second. 
Mm. Well, from all sessions, users, sessions, from all sessions. And let's grab um, private web browser, new incognito window. Let's do this. GPS slash slash controller dashboard. One of the caveats of having this stuff is that, um, uh, like you saw before, you really the, you have to sync both of the timeouts from the um, from the IDP and your backend service provider. Because if you don't sync them up, um, basically it happens that it will go over and tell you, you know what, I'm going to try to authenticate it, but the service provider still has a timeout, so either you're going to let you pass or you're going to say, you know what, you don't have access into it. So let's see if we clear it up. There we go. Um, let's do MDO. So in the post binding, simul post. And now it's going to take a while because, like I said, it's only one VM running all the controllers in it. And now you have access into it. Like I said before, um, once you basically run the OpenStack commands, you're tying up that specific IDP provider into your federated domain to a specific federated project. Um, you already, it will basically go and allow you to log into it. Um, this whole blah <laughs> is the representation, uh, the global representation of the user. Um, there's uh, set up to go over and put it in there instead of doing that, just show MDO. Um, but uh, right now I didn't have time to put it in place. Uh, but as you can see, you can go over and tell it, you know what, I'm going to go over and sign out here now. Um, but now, let's say that you want to go over and tell it, you know what, um, Joe Doe, J Doe, you don't have access to this stuff. I still have time. Oh, okay, I'm running out. Um, he's not inside of the OpenStack users. So he shouldn't be able to log in into OpenStack unless you put it in place. Let's just give it a shot. Let me just real quick, um, MDO uh, sessions and log out. Uh, let's open another incognito. Mm, controller dashboard. Mm -hmm. oh, still, see that's the only thing that I'm I'm mentioning. Um, since still already in the back, let me just do with this one with this browser. Mm, controller dashboard. Yes, I know it's not secure. We're going to add the exception. Confirm. Like I mentioned, it's basically just a lab that we're going to be using. We're going to be connecting to the SSO. JDO, JDO. Login. In this case, as you can see, you're not authorized because you're not inside of the OpenStack users group. Uh, meaning that if I go over, wait for a timeout, put it in inside of the OpenStack user tube, so I'm going to be able to just log in there and will show up his own global user ID in that place. So now let's go over and do something for AWS itself. If we go back to the IDP, you're going to be able to see that there's a, uh, hold on, groups. There's an AWS users groups also as well. Um, let's say that now we're going to, um, JDO has access to it also as well. Um, let me just grab this here. This is the URL that you basically go over and tell it um, copy link address. Um, this is the difference between going over and doing an SPSSO and an I IDP SSO. The IDP will go over and tell you I need to go over and log in first to the IDP, a uh, new private window. In the case of the control B. In the case of AWS, since it's IDP, um, IDP SSO, you go first to the IDP, sorry. In the case of OpenStack, you go first to the um, SP um, to go over and do the authentication. Now we're going to try to log in here. Goes back to your IDP, MDO, MDO. And same user since password will go over and actually go over and let you now into AWS. You don't have to go over and have different users 
or create users locally in your public cloud provider or anything at, at all. Um, you'll see here that basically it goes over and gives you um, the demo and the federated login and works similar way that OpenStack is basically another federation that you're putting in place. Um, now, hold on, I still have time? Yeah, I do still have time. So now let's say that um, that user is going to have access to another pretty place, another applica an application that doesn't have anything in there. So doing the IDP with, um, with the secure proxy, what is going to happen? Now I'm going to target the secure proxy first to the authentication, and then based on that, we'll go over and let me log in or not um, to the actual application. If you go over and let's, let's just look into um, Prometheus demo. Uh, this is the site that I'm using for, for testing this out. This is just a Prometheus server that somebody put out there. They're using it for demo. No authentication whatsoever. You can just target it directly. Nobody's going to know what happens or if you go over and see the, um, I don't know, configuration or s some stuff like that. Um, but let's just go over and put it in behind, once you have it behind the, sorry, behind the IDP server and the secure um, proxy, let me just close a little bit of things here. Oh, come on, small. Um, you can go over and enable the authentication for it without having to modify the actual site. Um, let me just clear the users. Sessions, log out. And then we're going to try it out. Jojo also as well. Sessions, log out. Okay, let's see how, it, how we do with this stuff. The secure proxy, oh, sorry. Vault one. I have it running here on this port. What is going to happen here is that it will go over and try to proxy everything into it right away. It says, you know what, there's no states on, on actually how to do this stuff, so I'm going to go over and send you to the IDP provider. The IDP provider will go over and tell you log in. So depending on who you are, MDO, MDO, I'm going to try to log in. Now you have the same Prometheus server with the access authenticated. Like I mentioned it before, um, this basically is converting the Prometheus server into um, full OAuth 2 resource um, server. So you can literally protect it based on the URL. Let's say you want to have only the admins to connect to the config or access the config, you just define that into the specific map roles that you're passing into the secure proxy. Um, pretty much straightforward. I hate Windows. But now let's give it a shot with the other user that we're actually having problems here with. Um, let's try with uh, Jado, which she shouldn't have access. Let me just go over and double check that we're actually putting here. The demo's going pretty well. So on the roles that I have here, I have an admin, app admin itself, which is basically just who's going to have access to that Prometheus server. The user roles only um, MDO has access into it. You can see here the user name. I actually changed it. Uh, it was kind of like, don't worry about it. Um, so now we're going to go over and put it, uh, we're going to try it out. Um, Jado, who doesn't have um, access to that piece. So let's give it a really sh uh, shot real quick. Let's just see if we can open a new private window here so we don't have to deal with this stuff. Uh, come on. Vault one, let's go to our secure proxy. Jake Doe, Jake Doe. No, I don't have access. At least now there's some way to protect something that you can have in the back without actually having to modify or telling, trying to figure out who built this stuff 10 years ago or who built the uh, billing system and we don't have any figured out how to put it in there, right? Um, in this case, like I said, it's really straightforward. This doesn't matter if your application is running on OpenStack or if it's running on a bare metal control by Hironic or if it is running anywhere. Um, everything is done at the HTTP layer without um, any interaction with the underneath application or where it's actually located. 
um, as long as you pretty much go, as long as you go over and close the access into it um, from any other side, you can go over and just um, set up the, sorry, uh, you can just go over and protect it itself. Let me just go over and show you really quick um, how the config files are. Conference demo. So like I mentioned it here, you have the files into it. Um, so for in case of OpenStack, this is just really the configuration, basic configuration, nothing at all. What you need to enable here and look for is to enable mapped. And then on federation, you have to specify the remote uh, attribute, which is Melon IDP because I'm using Melon. Um, you could use Shibboleth also as well if you want to. Um, and then specify which is gonna be the trusted dashboard. This means that which um, trusted horizon is gonna uh, talk to you directly. And then just uh, template for the also sold callback if you want to use it. Um, once you have defined that, like I said, there's nothing else out there. Um, you just pretty much restart Keystone and the configuration from that point of view is done. Then you modify horizon. On Horizon, uh, it's, it has a way much more um, details on it, but the only pieces that you have to look for it is, first of all, um, to enable this part, which is telling it you're gonna enable SSO, it's gonna be using the map, and that SSO and Keystone credentials are the options that you're gonna be working on on the Horizon dashboard. Um, outside of that, everything else, like I said, is basic configuration, straightforward. Just follow up documentation. Um, then the map rules, um, sorry, then the federation. How do you enable this, um, all these pieces? Well, you go over and you have two options. In the case of Keycloak itself, it has a real cool um, HTTP client that goes over and you execute it from where you're gonna be running Melon. Melon usually runs inside of the same Keystone server because that way you don't have to go over and do any communication outside of it. Um, just pass over uh, the Melon, the IDP server, um, basic just uh, parameters. And then you pass which are gonna be the Keystone URLs that are gonna be protected, that are gonna work in, in the way of, oh, you know what, this is the URL that I'm gonna have to log in into it in order to see whether if I have access or not. So once you define those, um, these are really straightforward. It's, there's nothing that you're going to go over and change, except for instance, my SSO with your IDP name. Um, everything else, straightforward. Once that's set up, you go over and just create the domain for the federation. You create the project inside of that domain, and then you create a group for that specific domain also as well. You add the users. Um, I don't know why you actually put in here. Okay, this one doesn't go. Um, you, this is the one, this is the good one. Sorry, I'll, I'll modify that one and fix it up. Um, you add the group of those federated users into the federated domain, and then you specify which is gonna be your IDP. Um, you create the mapping rules, we're gonna go through that map, Johnson. And then you create the protocol that is gonna be talking between the map and the federation and the IDP provider. All those pieces are required to just um, show up that specific um, that specific flow that I mentioned it inside of the on the diagram for OpenStack. Um, now the map Johnson are the ones that are actually doing the mapping between one thing and the other. That's it. You don't need anything else. Um, pretty much here, what is happening is that you're telling it, okay, for the Group inside of this domain, call it federated users. The remote IDP, which is working with Melon, will translate it for Melon groups and look for the OpenStack users. These OpenStack users is what you have in your IDP. So, in your if you're in your IDP, you have public on oh, sorry private cloud users um, group. Then you just pretty much put it here. Um, if you need to add more groups, then you have to pretty much tie it up or match each of those groups inside of your IDP to groups inside of, with OpenStack. Um, like I said, is once you have that, you're pretty much good to go. You don't have to do or deal with anything else. Um, if you guys want to go over and see the other pieces, um, we have also as well the, like I said, the SAML client Johnson and the SAML metadata for AWS, straightforward also as well. 
is the IDP SAML client where you just go over and specify um, all the flags that are going to be done by SAML. Um, just modify the, cert uh, the certificates. Um, outside of that, you're going to tell it these are similar way that OpenStack has these protocols map into it. Um, the public cloud providers also have protocols map. This one depends on the public cloud. Um, so AWS might call it something. Um, the other ones might call it something else. You can just go over into the SAML authentication um, documentation for each of the public clouds to go over and put it. Um, then um, you go over and if you want to go over and see the um, secure proxy configuration. This is what is running here. I still have five minutes. Um, so we have, first of all, the authentication of the, cli the client setup, which is really straightforward. Um, you can just import this thing if you want to. Um, but what is actually looking here for is the redirect URLs, where it's going to go over and tell you where I'm going to be sending things. No, so, and those things have to match with the gatekeeper config. Here's where it comes, the tricky part. All the roles that you define inside of your IDP, this is where you go over and just put them in place. Mention that anybody has, that is inside or has the role app admin, is gonna have access to everything. So if here if you put like slash config um, app admin, only the app admin has access to slash config. If you put up here role um, user on the, I don't know, slash graph, only those user roles, uh, all, only those users that have that role um, will go over and have access to it. Outside of it, uh, anything else is really just discover URL is your IDP server, um, where it's gonna be listening your, your proxy, what is gonna be the website in case that doesn't have access, so you can customize it, and which is gonna be the backend app that you're gonna forward in the traffic once the IDP is actually logged into it. Um, sometimes they go over and ask me, like, why don't you just use this stuff for OpenStack as well? Um, the reason is because you could probably just tie it up and protect Horizon the same way. But if you go over and do it in the SAML option, you will go over and tell it. Um, now you have to make sure that you have the um, OpenStack roles to do the other different pieces, um, like create VMs or anything like that. And that being said, um, Kubernetes, same thing happens, um, why is the client? Um, the other thing is just follow up the, everything that I put on the presentation. Um, and I still have three minutes. Well, I mean, I'm done. So that being said, uh, let me just go around here really quick. Let me see what else I have here. Yeah. And this is pretty much it. So um, I'm running out of time real quick. So um, thank you very much. Any questions, feel free to just ask me afterwards.